Yes. How you guys uh, doing all today? Everyone's good. Ready to go? I'm great. Looking Rolly, forward. You, got your, you got your pants on, Dan? Uh, half on. Half on. It's a new strategy. Ah, uh, half on. I like this style. Now you can like half confuse us when you stand up. Technically not illegal. <laughs> Technically not. I also you noticed that you had a uh, new hairstyle today. You have the part kind of look. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's this is really this is really just uh, whatever it does, and I just kind of you know I need a haircut is really what it comes down to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Looks good. Looks good. And Brendan's Thanks. looking sharp with his uh, plaid shirt going on. He thinks he's living in Portland, Oregon right now. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Do you have, like, do you have, like a latte time. next to you, and like maybe like a craft beer to the, the right of you. <laughs> Yeah, for next time. I'll have to do that for next time. <laughs> it might be somewhere awesome if we all just sipped on craft beer while we recorded these. I don't know. Just that. <laughs> yeah, I feel like we have enough trouble staying on topic as it is. If we uh, added alcohol, it'd be yeah. Yeah, a little bit erratic. Uh, <laughs> by the end of the show, we'll be arguing. Yeah, I'll be crying. <laughs> then yeah. rise and shine will be like rise and pass out. <laughs> right, we'll make a million dollars on YouTube, but no one will learn anything. <laughs> Exactly. Well, we got to make our money somehow. Speaking of there money, um, this is McLean Warren with Liaison Marketing. I'm here with um, my two co-hosts. We have Brendan Fields with Rebate and Dan Trumbull with Dan Trumbull Consulting. Say hi, everybody. Hey, guys. <laughs> hey, y'all. What's up? Um, so, yeah, the topic today, which is um, specifically good to talk about during the holidays with all of the ups and downs with um, Black Friday, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Cyber Monday. I know I said those all out of order, but you guys get the gist. Um, there's a lot of price differentiations that are going to happen in the next few months. Or actually, I guess we're already almost close to December, so really just this month and a little bit into January. Um, so we thought we would talk about pricing structure and strategy, and um, I'm going to actually kick this off to Brendan. Um, I'll let you kind of talk about, you wrote an article recently about this, correct? Yeah, so I did. So, um, yeah, so pricing is definitely a important subject, and I think a lot of sellers kind of just get caught in the easy to follow metric, which is gross sales. So everybody's you know, you see on all these groups and forums, everybody's looking at, um, you know, sh sharing screenshots of what their, um, you know, total sales are, that, that classic um, picture of their Amazon sales report. And, um, you know, that tells, I was going to say half the story, but in some cases, I think even less than half the story, because, um, you know, just like any business, you need to be selling your product at a price that um, is viable to generate a profit and, and you know, maintain um, you know, a viable business, uh, in the long term. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of, you know, the basis for why it's uh, so important. Now, when you say that, are you referring to, um, Amazon specifically or brick and mortar wall, Walmart, any of those, whether it's e-commerce or brick and mortar in general, you think that that is the case? Yeah, so I think uh, I think it's the case regardless of what business you have or where you sell. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's just kind of a fundamental of business. And I think a lot of sellers need to recognize that they're not just a seller, but it's your business. And if you want to, um, you know, have your business generate earnings and, and take a salary from your business, you do need to um, generate a generate a profit. Um, and I know just before we started recording, we were talking about, um, you know, the, imp the importance of, um, I lost my train of thought for a second. Uh, Someone the, does uh, it on every show we do. <laughs> that's okay. Now I remember it's going to be one of those days. So um, the importance of considering all the costs that go into um, selling your product and bringing it to market. So um, like, I think a lot of sellers, they look at their, you know, cost to purchase a product and subtract that from their sales price and think that's their profit. Um, and that is their gross profit. That's not their net profit. So, um, you know, there's a lot of other things eating into that margin, like um, your advertising costs, your shipping costs, um, your returns, that's a big one, um, your utility bill, your warehouse, uh, you know, rent if you do have a warehouse. So um, there's a huge number of things that eat into that number and, and uh, you know, e-commerce being competitive as it is, 
you really can't, um, in many cases, price your product, uh, you know, at whatever you want. You are dictated somewhat by the market and what other sellers are selling for, uh, you know, a similar product for. So, yeah, I mean, you have to be, I, I guess the point is you have to be all over your numbers and know exactly what your margins are and what um, you're making or not making, you know, on a monthly basis. I think that with the change of people moving from brick and mortar to online sales, people don't think about like, if you're actually selling from a store, you have to think about your rent, your overhead, your employees, you know, your electricity bill, stuff like that. But a lot of people forget that even though you're selling online, there's a lot of that overhead that you still have to account for. And so I think that's really one of the biggest, at least I've seen with my clients, one of the biggest, um, you know, issues that they get into is that they kind of think, oh, if I'm selling online, my overhead's not going to be much. Yeah. Thoughts, Dan? Yeah. Um, I, I think Brendan hit it, hit the nail on the head. You know, it's, it's net profit versus gross profit. Uh, you know, any, before I buy any product, before my clients buy any product, we put everything into a spreadsheet and we're, we're sure to include any of the fixed costs we can. But even if, even if there's going to be fluctuating costs, for example, FBA storage fees, you don't know how long that product is going to sit there and how, how many of them are going to sit there for how long. So we don't really know. But what we do know is how long the average product sits there for that type of product in that type of account. So you can at least account for that being subtracted from your gross profit and get to a more realistic number of net profit. Uh, you know, obviously the less you spend, the more profit, the, the money you don't have to spend, you get to keep is really what it comes down to. So uh, or you can put it towards something more valuable to right. add value to your product. Right, right. Um, so for people watching that may not know the difference between net profit and gross profit, why don't one of you explain that? Brendan? Sure. So, uh, so your gross profit is just your direct cost. So you take your revenue, you subtract the cost of goods sold, which is the cost of the item you're selling. Uh, there's a few different ways I've seen it done, but I think usually it's like landed cost. So uh, it's your cost, you know, including the shipping to get your product. Um, you know, into the U.S. and sold, um, and then everything else beneath that, um, without going too much into accounting, would be like your general administrative expense and advertising costs, and and everything that goes towards supporting your business to operate and to actually, you know, have a, a foundation to sell the product itself. So. And then beneath that is the net profit. That's. Uh, what you're left with or not left with, depending on you know um, what your what your costs are. Um, and then actually, McLean, just to build off a point you mentioned or started talking about before, I remember when I started selling online. A lot of people said, "Well, it's a great thing to sell online because you don't have all this overhead. You don't have rent. You don't have utilities. You don't have all these costs." Um, <clears throat> but uh, there's also you have a lot more competition. So like. If you go to a brick and mortar store, um, you know, you see the price of a product, you have a sense maybe generally if it's a good, a good price, but you're not seeing that direct competition. So, uh, you know, on Amazon, you could see a hundred products that are fairly similar um, within seconds. And, and so for that reason, there's a huge amount of pressure on your top line, you know, uh, revenue because of that easy comparison shopping. So it's kind of a double-edged sword you know, you have a lower overhead cost, but much higher competition, much easier comparison shopping for, uh, you know, for shoppers. So. And one thing you mentioned before we started recording was adding value to your product so that you can actually increase um, the overall price of your product so that your margins are a bit larger. Do you want to speak on that a little bit more? Yeah, so the idea behind that is value pricing. So like the, I guess the best example of value pricing is, um, so you, you created a software and it saved a company $2 million a year. You could sell your, pro your software for a million dollars a year and it would be effectively free to the company you sold it to. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, I guess a software example, but um, the, I guess as far as products sold on Amazon, 
is if you can develop something that has some proprietary feature or some attribute that um, really differentiates it. And I see differenti differentiation used kind of loosely on Amazon. People say, well, my you know, product is a slightly different color. Right. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something that, you know, it's actual real value. So like the classic would be something that's patented or, um, you know, a trademark on a name that's known as being trustworthy. Like um, I always think with like supplements, I would be skeptical um, and that's not a knock on supplement sellers, but um, to take a supplement from a, you know, small seller, because I know that they don't have the infrastructure to do quality control that like a big company does. So that's, that wouldn't be on the patent side. That would be on the trademark side. You know, they have a, a trademark brand name that's known as being trustworthy, but um, in whatever case, you know, bringing something, having some value that um, allows you to price your product higher than others and still generate sales um, is, uh, is, is important. It's hard to get to, but that should be, I think, every seller's goal because it's hard to have a long-term profitable business without, without that. And let's expand on that a little bit more um, with regards to getting customers to want to actually pay more. That is, you know, like you said, it's kind of a juxtaposition because on Amazon or Walmart or eBay or any, you know, any place that you're selling on, you do have that direct competition. And a lot of the time people's response is just to either match the competitive prices or go even lower because they think that people just want to pay lower prices, which is true in a lot of cases. Like for example, if you're selling something like, you know, like Windex cleaner or, you know, just something that's an inexpensive product in general that doesn't have much of a differentiation, no matter what brand you use, et cetera, then, you know, you probably will want to go competitive with your prices. But like you were saying with the supplements, you know, like I personally know I'm willing to spend more money on my supplements because I care about the quality of them. And I want to know that they're regulated properly and, you know, that they meet all the FDA approvals, even though I understand supplements have to, but it just speaks back to your assessment that, um, you know, if you can provide Let's give you an example, makeup. I know you guys wear a lot of makeup, so you'll totally understand and relate to this. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, there's women out there, I'm not one of them, but there's women that are willing to spend a lot of money on makeup. And there's a large range of types of makeup out there in terms of quality. But when you get into like stuff like, is it vegan? Is it, you know, gluten-free? Yes, people actually care if your makeup is gluten-free. I'm not making that up, that's a real thing. Low carb? Um, what? Is it low carb? It is, yes. So you can eat your makeup too if you want. It's really right. the moral of this entire video is that if you want to eat your makeup, <laughs> spend a lot of money on it because then you're less likely to get sick. <laughs> right. So. Yeah, don't forget uh, detoxing. That's uh, exactly. my wife's buzzword. It's worth three times to four times more if it's detoxing. So. Nice. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so Dan, I, I want to circle back to what you were talking about with your spreadsheets and how you do that, because at the end of the day, we can sit and talk about value or quantity versus quality, which is really what we're talking about. In this yeah. instance. Um, but at the end of the day, I think people really want to understand the techniques and mechanisms of doing that actual accounting and looking at the books and saying, you know, and like we were saying before, I keep going back to before we start recording because we talked for at least 15 minutes before I'm all supposed to see this. Um, but just going into working, you know, I brought this up is in terms of working backwards instead of forward. Um, so Dan, if you can, you know, expand on that a little bit, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. So anytime I'm reviewing a product, it, it has to pass a certain set of criteria, basic product, physical criteria, we won't go into that now, but then it gets plugged into the spreadsheet. And part of that criteria is the math. Can we make money with this product? If you can't, then it's a no, sell something else. So every single expense that you can think of needs to have a line item. And then there just needs to be a, a, you know, a sum total at the bottom. And you know if that sum total doesn't meet your goals, then that product's simply not a good fit. I wanted to circle back around. Uh, we were talking about differentiators. Um, a little, a little 
tip, I guess, trick or whatever that uh, some of my clients have used and I have used is when you're scouring the competitive landscape to see if you want to buy and sell a certain product or type of product. Of course, you're going to be looking at what, you know, what the competitors are doing. You're going to be looking at their reviews. How many do they have? Are they dominating the market or this keyword? Also look at their negative reviews. And if you notice a pattern in those negative reviews, that might be an opportunity for you to, to really build value through a simple differentiation. Like, Brand, like Brendan said, it's not going to be a slightly different shade of purple or pink but it might be something where it's a more ergonomic handle or um, it's, silic it's made of silicone instead of latex. You know, if, if you notice some sort of negative pattern of, uh, of those product reviews uh, of your competitors, potential competitors, that's a great opportunity to differentiate that can be impactful and have perceived value for potential buyers. Right. And then you can increase the price of your product because Absolutely. Is, right. Yeah. Until somebody copies you. <laughs> <laughs> Which, yeah, they most definitely will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other, uh, I, the other thing I wanted to talk about is um, if you're selling on Amazon, which if you're not yet, you'll learn, uh, you'll have access to an automated pricing tool. It's called Automate Pricing. It's a very creative name. Uh, and, and it allows you to set pricing rules, include products in those rules. Some of those rules will allow you to do things like um, chase the buy box. So you can match the buy box. You can stay a fixed amount beneath the buy box. I don't recommend that. We call that race to the bottom. Uh, or you can stay a little bit above the buy box. Uh, but you can also set rules that are based that are based in sales logic. If I haven't sold one unit in two days, I want you to lower my price by $2. Uh, of course, there's minimum and maximum prices that, uh, that it will move that price up and down in between. But it can be a really valuable tool, especially if you're not selling private label, if you're selling wholesale or RA or OA type product where you do have a ton of competition and the price, especially this time of year, fluctuates greatly. Uh, you know, January, so we're at the beginning of December as we sit, we're at the end of November, beginning of December as we sit and shoot this video. So the next month will be crazy, but then in January or as we refer to it as returnuary, mm -hmm. uh, as returnuary happens, there's also a massive void of product, right? So um, everyone's all sold out and they're trying to get their stuff back and, and everyone's trying to do their stuff before the Chinese New Year hits. So there's a void of many products or at least there's less sellers of those products and supply and demand simply dictates that, you know, less supply, same demand, it'll, you know, the price goes up. So not only, strategically planning your pricing and using net profit and gross profit properly, but also strategically planning your inventory and making sure that you're, you're the person with the product when the customer wants it matters a great deal too. Now, Brennan, since you um, specifically specialize in the launching and the very beginning, essentially the beginning part of someone's journey on Amazon or any kind of platform, do you recommend that, again, this is just the preliminary spot where you're trying to get sales and you're trying to lower your BSR and get ranked, et cetera. Do you recommend going, starting low and competitive and then slowly um, increasing your price to recommend matching your competitors or going above and why? Yeah, um, so I, I always recommend starting with a higher price and going lower. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. So um, one, I know we've talked about it in previous epi episodes. Um, when you have a higher price and lower it, you can get that slash through price on your listing and it shows you know lowest price in 30 days. And that works particularly well once you get to the first page and it's getting more and more competitive. You know, Having a few little extra touches on your listing like, you know, lowest price in 30 days. Um, that helps you stay on page one and just overall helps your listing. So um, I, I always suggest starting higher and lowering your price as you, uh, you know, as you launch your product. Dan? I couldn't agree more, 100%. Uh, you know, just to expound on what Brendan was saying, uh, it's great to get that slash through price at that point of sale. It really, when you think about 
the psychology of a customer, of a buyer, a lowest price in 30 days, everyone loves to get a deal. You know what I mean? So they, they're more likely to click that big orange button at that point. Also, if you do it the reverse way, if you go, if you redline your price and, and then you're getting great rank and you're getting nice, nice velocity, and now you go from $12 to $20, it can suppress your buy box. And what that means is that even though you're the only seller of your private label item, if right. that's what you're selling, you'll lose the buy box because it'll use some sort of algorithm and say, no, this is too much based on previous sales. It's not logical to make this kind of leap in pricing. And that can happen quite by accident and it can stick around for months and be a general pain in the neck. Uh, so, and overall we're trying to make money. So you're gonna, you wanna sell your product for, for a good value, but really for as much as you can, as much as the market is willing to pay for it. So test it out at a higher price, even maybe even higher than you think and throw a coupon on it in addition. Uh, and, and you can always lower it a little bit incrementally, especially if you have a repricer or you're using automate repricing through Amazon. I like coupons too, because I feel like a lot of people miss them. <laughs> Agreed. Well, it also makes your it also makes your product show up in different places and deal shopper places on and off Amazon. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, a good point, McLean. So a lot of people do that. They see the coupon, but they don't apply it. That's uh it's almost mm -hmm. like the mail-in rebate. So, so like true. a lot of people buy a product, they think they're gonna, you know, fill out this long rebate form and get, you know, two hundred dollars off of it and they lose it and they never do it. It's the same thing with the coupons. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's never a hundred percent redemption rate ever. Yeah. yeah, I think I read, I mean, this is a little off topic, but I read somewhere that like in the US, just not with coupons, but for gift cards, the amount of people or the amount of money that isn't actually spent because people either lose them or don't use them or forget about them is like, I don't remember the number, but it's astronomical. It is, it is. And it's it's part <laughs> of gift card companies. They, they build that into their strategy and profit. They know that they won't have 100% redemption. And of course, they have expiration dates. So as soon as that card is expired, that money's no good anymore and they get to keep it. Yeah. One time. I actually, uh, not to go with a last comment on that. So for, for rebate, that was something we thought about doing was offering uh, gift cards as the rebates in addition to checks and, and the different things. And I talked to a company that does that. They, they do gift cards and they would sell us a $25 gift card for $20 um, and they still made a killing. So they knew that so few people would use yeah. the full balance. Many don't even use the balance at all. Um, that, it, I mean, and they, they acknowledge that, that that's uh, just part of the model of, uh, sure. of gift cards. And yeah, back to Amazon. I mean, it does drive a lot of traffic and a lot of conversions, having that extra coupon uh, symbol or whatever, you know, badge on there. But a lot of people don't even click it, which is uh, right. Great. right. <laughs> uh, real, real quick, in case people are wondering, we're talking about coupons. It's a, it's a mechanism that you can build in. The, the, essentially, as we sit here today, uh, in the end of November 2020, it costs you whatever your discount is. So if you put a $5 coupon on there, you don't have to pay that, but you don't get that money if the customer redeems it. The only other cost associated with coupons is $0.60 cents per redemption that Amazon charges. So it's also a pretty inexpensive way to get some good exposure to a product. Yeah. Um, as a final conversation tool, I would like to address, you know, I think people, at least from my experience, and you both might have different experiences, but I feel like people usually are good at um, figuring out their landing costs, like you mentioned, Brendan, um, their shipping, um, their freight, all that stuff. Um, manufacturing, but again, they're not looking at the advertisement. And I want to kind of touch on the stuff that people end up spending a lot of money on. And I personally know this because my business is for marketing and advertising, right? So we're looking at PPC costs. We're looking at photography. We're looking at listing optimizations. We're looking at all the stuff that I think a lot of people don't calculate into their expenses. And I just kind of wanted to touch on that because I think it's really important because again, to go back to the brick and mortar and, uh, you know, explanation or um, comparison, 
that even if you have your overhead or what you think of as your overhead, even though that's paid for and you already have figured out your profit margins, you still haven't calculated in what you're going to do for advertisement. So with brick and mortar, that might be, you know, taking out ads in the newspaper. I know it's kind of old school or, you know, stuff like that or a billboard or something like that, but it's the same for online. Um, Brendan, your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think that all goes under kind of a broader concept of like operational efficiency, which is in addition to, you know, having a, a product that has a lot of value, you can also get a long-term advantage by just being operating more efficiently and that, you know, um, would be efficient advertising management, um, efficient shipping. So you're getting, you know, good costs on shipping your products, especially if you establish a presence in the West Coast, if you're shipping from Asia, um, you know, or, you know, continue with like warehousing rather than get your own warehouse, use a deliver type service where you're just paying for what you use. That way, if you have a slow time of year, we have less inventory, you're not paying for a big open space, you know, big empty warehouse. So like all those sort of things, um, again, those are kind of your general administrative and advertising expenses. If you're efficient there, you can actually um, outcompete your competitors because you can sell your product at a lower price than them and still make a profit. So like, I think that's something that's, you know, focused on by, by sellers as well. I mean, that's how Walmart did it. That literally, like that's Walmart's, business strategy is to do the most efficient supply chain, just in time delivery, the least amount of human touches. And, and because of that, and, and of course, coupled with insanely large buying power, uh, that makes them be able to sell, you know, what would normally be a $20, $12 bucket of pickles for five bucks, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have, I have something I wanted to touch on. I talk to my clients a lot about this. I talk about profit leaks and there's a lot of profit leaks in this business, uh, but really it's just shrink. Anyone that's familiar with retail knows that there's shrink product disappears, things break. Same things happen at Amazon. Uh, one of the, one of the big profit leaks that I look for with a client is items that were uh, damaged or lost while checking shipments in or while transferring goods around the country. Amazon says they reimburse you for that automatically you should double check. Yeah. Uh, and then the last part is storage fees. Lots of people think about the storage fees, less people actually incorporate them in. And even less people think about the three, the three or four stages of storage fees. So in the first six months, if your product is standard size, you're going to receive standard size storage fees. If your product ages out to 181 days or older, you're going to get long-term storage fees. If it's October, November, or December, you're gonna receive holiday storage fees. And the difference of that can be like 400% more. Uh, and then you'd think I'd be done, but nope, there's another kind of storage fees. Uh, and, and that one is if your IPI is below 500 and you have some sort of storage limit on your account uh, and that happens while you have those products in there, the products that are over that storage amount will get blasted with storage fees. And of course, all of this uh, if you haven't planned for it, is unexpected. It's a profit leak, and it severely negatively impacts your profitability. Yeah, yeah that's a big one. Storage is huge. Storage kills profit, and especially this time of year, like it's I wouldn't say negligible cost, but it's pretty low. And then all of a sudden, it's like, what is it? November is the first month, or December? Like October. November. Yeah. Oh, it's October now. October. Yeah, yeah. They and changed it two years, years ago. All of a sudden, your balance is down $5,000 yeah. in storage. It's crazy. It's totally crazy. It is. It is. Yeah. So I guess the moral of the story is make sure that you pay close attention to those storage fees. Because at the end of the day, yeah, you might find a great manufacturer that makes your product at a really good cost. But once you factor in all of your uh, landing costs and your storage fees and the stuff that Amazon takes out from their end. And then again, going back to the um, advertisement, um, if you hire an agency to do your PPC, you have to pay them to you know, do your PPC as well as your daily budget. How much money do you wanna spend a day on that? You know, it's just a lot of stuff. And this isn't to scare anyone off or say, oh, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't sell yeah. online. It's just to say, really think about all of those costs because they will get you in the end if you know you're not 
intentionally. Yeah, I think the bottom line is the bottom line. This is a business. And if it's not treated as so, if you treat it like a hobby, it's going to act like a hobby. But you need to treat it like a business. You have to have line item expenses and you have to be constantly monitoring profit leaks. And, you know, that's just how business works. Yeah. Any final words from you, Mr. Fields? No, just to, uh, yeah, build on what Dan said. That was like a big breakthrough for me is when I finally learned just the basics of accounting. I was able to create my own financial statements each month because I was very sensitive to that. If I had a month where I was down a little bit, I would go deeper into it and see, you know, was that driven by a certain product that, you know, I had to cut the cost on or the sales price or, you know, just be super on top of that. And it's so boring. It sucks. It's hard to learn accounting. But once you do, um, you know, it totally changes everything. You can actually be, you know, agile and, and make changes to, um, you know, make sure you're actually making money, which at the end of the day, everybody talks about ranking and reviews and pictures and whatever. It's all about making money. It's a business, right? So, um, you know, that's, uh, I guess, my final word on it. Yeah, I, Brendan, I, I agree with you. If someone wants to invest, I don't know, a couple hundred bucks or whatever it costs, it doesn't really matter. And take an accounting 101 class online, uh, that pays dividends quick. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks guys for joining me per usual. I love seeing your awesome faces every week. Um, yeah. Let everyone plug their businesses real fast, starting with Dan. Sure, uh, dantrumbleconsulting.com. Uh, I've been a Amazon seller since 08, been in e-commerce since 1998. I help Amazon sellers from uh, conception, even if they don't even have uh, a seller account, we can start there, all the way up to, we're currently doing 50,000 a month and we wanna do 100,000. I offer things like PPC management, product sourcing, uh, and complete Amazon account management. And he can help you make a spreadsheet. <laughs> I can help you make a spreadsheet. That's true. <laughs> That's worth all of it right there. <laughs> That's right. Brendan? Yep. Uh, rebate, rebate.com. It's a uh, rebate based launch platform for generating full price sales on Amazon. And uh, now we're also doing Walmart, eBay, Etsy, and independent web stores. So, um, yeah, so get full price sales and launch your product with rebate.com. Awesome. And I am McLean Warren with liaisonmarketing.com. That's L-I-A-Z-O-N um, marketing. And um, we do all, as you would guess, marketing. So if you need a listing optimization, photography, PPC, we do it all. All right. Thanks, guys. And we'll be back here next week. Thank you. Bye.